Okay. Um, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, just a little bit about myself and about the company I worked for. Uh, we're going to try a, a something, uh, by the way, uh, this is not PowerPoint, um, something called Prezi, maybe a, another tool that I'm going to start using from now on. Um, if you are in the front rows, you might feel a little seasick, so I'm sorry for that. Um, so let's just see if it works. How are you feeling? Okay. If you want to know about me, uh, there's a lot. Basically, everything you need to know about me is at oshrov.com, including courses on TDD and team leadership. But this talk is about development. And what I'm going to cover is how we do development, how I personally do development at TypeMock, where I, where I work. We're going to cover several areas. Um, uh, the tools that we're going to cover will be either in the team room, what tools and techniques we're using. Some of them might be quite obvious to uh, our dev attendees, but I want to stress them. Then we're going to talk about what's installed on my personal dev machine, and we're going to see some, some demos of some of the tools. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we use the Amazon EC2 cloud in production, with hopefully some demos as well. Um, what happens in, in our build servers, how everything is hosted, and what happens after deployment? How do we gain insight about our applications and how that helps us be better developers to our customers? Okay. Um, so in the team room, there are three basic things. I had to choose from a lot of things. So there are three basic things that I think really make us better. And that is removing software and start, starting to use task boards. Uh, this is not our task board. This is actually from the visual management blog. The reason I, you're not seeing our task board is because ours is much uglier. We're working on it, though. I'm, I'm starting to learn how to actually predefine things as well. Um, and I think this is uh, part of the reason we are more productive is because there is a more visibility into how things actually work and how things actually don't work. One of the first things I did when I came to uh, a different job much earlier was create a task board because no one knew, really knew what was going on. But that, uh, the, the boss basically came in and said, oh, what's this? And we started having a real conversation about really what's going on. He said, why are all these cards right here in the middle in the to-do list? In the actually, uh, not in the to-do, in the in progress. He said, that's exactly what's going on. We have a lot of stuff in progress. We need to start pruning them and so on. So it's a great basis for a conversation to have with your boss about what's really going on in your development team. If nothing else, it's the basis for a conversation. Uh, two screens. We, uh, about two years ago, we decided that all, developer, all developers will have two screens. I know that in Norway and Sweden, and this is kind of uh, uh, OK, so. I mean, how many people have here have two screens at least? Exactly, OK. So this is not very common in, in places outside of Scandinavia, I have to tell you. Uh, I remember w working at the, at the place where we had 15-inch screens, just one screen, and I was working there for a while. At some point, I just gave up and went and bought my own 17-inch screen. Back then, it was all the rage, and I bought it, and I, I hooked it up onto my machine, and everyone was looking at me and said, how did you get that machine? And I said, I had to pay a lot of money for that. This is actually my own personal money. But since we started using uh, multiple monitors, uh, what we find is that, A, we answer email a lot more. <laughs> So our marketing guys are happy. I don't know if you know this, but marketing guys and sales guys think that developers are kind of autistic because they don't answer emails when there's nothing to answer. Right? I don't, if, if you've ever had someone say to you, well, why don't you just say that you got the email and that you don't have anything to say? If you've never heard this, that's good. Maybe it's just me. But uh, salespeople seem to really want to communicate with other people. Developers are mostly event-based only when something truly needs to be transferred into some sort of a gateway, they will actually transfer data. So emails come in, but they never come out of developers, unless there is something interesting. But this is kind of like a constant notification that there are other things going on in the company as well that you might uh, start noticing. This kind of goes against the fact that uh, we say that developers need to be in the zone and not to be disturbed. But when we work in a startup of 12 people, uh, there is no such thing of uh, not being part of the context that's really going on uh, around you. Uh, s things always change. You never know what's going to happen. And 
of course, uh, at least at the very least, if you don't answer email, it's great to have the debug window on one side, like the debug points and all that stuff, and the code window on the, on the other side. It does make things much clearer and understandable for developers. And of course, the third part is daily stand-ups. Of course, that's, again, not a big deal for you guys, right? Who does daily stand-ups? OK. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is that on daily stand-ups, there are like not really stand-ups sometimes. Uh, if you've ever seen someone on a daily stand-up do, do, do this, that's not a stand-up. Because this enables them at least 10 more minutes of being in the stand-up without feeling tired. Okay? Um, so one thing that we try to do is to actually, uh, if we see someone like just resting on the wall or something like that, to actually ask them politely um, to actually stand up with no help from any object around them so that literally it will be unreasonable to do this for more than 10 minutes. So if you do stand-ups, see that there are actually people standing up and not leaning, okay? That's not the, the, the meaning of being lean, that to lean on other things during the stand-up. Actually, there's a blog called the Lean Blog, which is just people, pictures of people leaning on something. Like, <laughs> seriously. Like, people leaning unneedlessly on things. Okay, so that's the team room. So far, so good. But what happens on my own personal dev machine? Um, several tools which, uh, every time I show them, people don't really know them. Who is using this tool? One, two, okay. So hopefully, by now, uh, you know that there are uh, uh, various uh, launchers in Windows, like Launchy and stuff like that, Slick Run, and so on. Everything search engine, first of all, I love the name. Uh, I'm just going to bring it up here. I usually map it to uh, Windows and Z here. Uh, what, uh, what everything search engine, engine does is when you install it, it m indexes all your drives in less than a minute. Uh, it doesn't index the content of files. It just indexes the names. Hence the beauty of it. If I want to find all the versions of nunit.dll that exist on my machine, this is uh, how fast it, it, it behaves. It also searches inside the GAC and so on. Let's say um, system.xml DLL. So I can see all the versions of that DLL on my machine. As a developer, this saves me a lot of time, especially when you have versioning nightmares and so on. But I'll just use it as a, as a, as a launcher as well. For example, you just say the name of the application, like reflector and exe. You'll find it quickly, just press this and you open the application. So since I've had this, and it's free by the way, um, it's, uh, my life has changed because I see people looking like opening Explorer and then clicking here and then opening that little doggy who searches in Windows sometimes on Windows XP. What's that about? I don't understand still. Um, one dog that should be put, put to sleep, I'm sorry to say that. So that's uh, um, uh, one thing. Then there is Total Commander. Who uses Total Commander or something like it? Okay, maybe 27% of the people here. So Total Commander, if you don't know it, the idea behind Total Commander is that it's a file manager, but it's always divided into two panes. I'd, uh, if on Windows 3.1, someone told me, there were, there were used to be two panes in the file explorer, but then they were gone. This makes you ultimately much more productive, especially when you need to work with files. Usually when you work with files, you need to start moving them around, copying them, zipping them around. This is not free, and most of the software you're going to see is not free. But uh, uh, what this enables me is several really hardcore things in one application. For example, of course, everything is shortcut based, so I don't need to use the mouse. Uh, one thing I that I can do is I can always have a target and source directory so I can copy files. Okay, so no big deal. Uh, then you can actually start having uh, shortcuts, right? Control D will uh, create a shortcut from the current directory you're in, and suddenly you can start zipping around uh, for shortcuts. So I'm going to show you what Total Commander looks like on my machine. It's kind of ugly, I fully agree, but uh, it's very, very practical. One of the things you're going to start noticing is that some of the files actually have different colors. That's because you can configure it to show different colors for different file extensions. For example, files I don't care about, I usually put in gray, so I don't get, get too bogged down with the details. Uh, 
if I want to, I can connect via FTP. I can start zipping things around. I can unzip, of course. I can. Uh, um, one of the things that I like is to be able to select a bunch of files from the same extension. Uh, of course, I don't have a numlock here, but if I press Alt plus on a specific file extension, right, if right, in, right now I'm here. So I can select something. But if I want to select all the files with this extension, right now only one is selected with space, but I can just say Alt plus, and it will select all the files with this extension in the current selection. I can have multiple renames inside, really using, uh, for example, I can control M, and I can say, oh, of course, because it's numlock enabled, control M, I can say, look, I want you to replace the ex extension of all the files to dot back, right there. And when I do this, oh, it's coming renaming because one of them is in use. It's actually part of the demo. But I can rename multiple files very easily. It saves a lot of time. Uh, so just these two, 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 two tools together can, uh, can save hours a day, basically, just instead of moving around. This is a zip file, by the way. By pressing Control and left, I can see the contents of it. I can unzip stuff into it. Uh, one of the nicest things is that you can create custom columns that you can s actually say, uh, I want to show uh, the custom column where I see the versions of uh, .NET. In this case, I don't have any versions. Uh, but I will see like a custom column here that give me the version of the DLL so I can compare versions of DLLs. Um, that's just maybe 5% of what this stuff can do. Of course, you can see trees and so on. Uh, so that's Total Commander. Uh, there are several of these things out there. Uh, once you get to know one, here's, here's one thing you need to learn. If you've started with this or you're serving salamander or stuff like that, once you've started one you learned all its shortcuts, you can never go back to any other file manager. That's one thing I can tell you. I've tried to leave Total Commander to something that looks better, but I couldn't. I just couldn't because this is really an extension of my hand right now. I don't need, I, I can't really work without it. Here's the next tool. This is pretty simple. Who uh, uses Reflector here? Okay. Uh, reflector, so just quickly, Reflector allows you to just browse source code. I'm just going to bring it up. Um, so I can browse source code inside system, DLL, and C Sharp, C Sharp code provider, press space, and see the actual code either in C Sharp or whatever I want. This is helpful, especially if you're doing hardcore stuff like trying to work with some of the Microsoft frameworks. Uh, sometimes they don't work. That's what I'm going to say. Um, so Reflector, awesome. And it's free. Resharper, who uses Resharper or Coderush? Damn, you guys are advanced. You thought you were coming to an advanced lecture, didn't you? Okay, so if you do know Resharper, I'm going to so show some cool Resharper stuff that I like. Maybe you don't know some of it. Um, uh, maybe, let's see, okay. Let's see if this works. Of course, in Visual Studio, one of the useful tricks that I like to do is to work in, in, uh, in uh, full screen mode. Uh, there are several tricks in, inside Visual Studio that I like to do. But for ReSharper specifically, the way I use it for code that I don't know is to start navigating it. So one of the most useful things in ReSharper is that you can actually navigate things and see who's using something but in a much cleaner way than Visual Studio allows. Of course, this works in, in all the versions of Visual Studio, not just 2010. Um, if I press Control-Alt-F7, I can see all the usages, and if I move over them, I can actually see a little tooltip right over there that tells me how it's used. That's like the quick shortcut. If I press Alt-F7, I will go to a more detailed explanation of where things are with the exact line and so on. Then I can press shift escape to close any tool window in, in Visual Studio. I bet you didn't know that. Most people don't. And this actually saves at least uh, 20 minutes per day just closing tool windows, just so you know. Um, one of the things that ReSharper will do, of course, is it will uh, show you text that's uh, uh, code that's not used. Um, I personally like it when I need to see inheritance chains. If you've just been, been to the previous talk, you know that inheritance could be bad. But if you're going to uh, cruise uh, someone else's code, uh, you can press Control-Alt-H to see the, in the inheritance tree. 
of something and all the types that inherit from it. And uh, of course, each type can have types that inherit from it, and then you can jump in and see all of them. Shift escape. Um, so we sharpen mainly for navigation and refactoring. Let's see if there's anything else that I could absolutely show with ReSharper. Um, well, those are the basic things that I really like. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, one thing that it has is like a stack trace uh, viewer. So if you like have a stack trace from n unit and so on, you can actually say uh, browse stack trace here, and it will try to actually paste things in here. In this case, it just have a Google search. And we'll show them as links if it, it, it finds any, any interesting lines of code. And then you can just click those links. Um, let's see if there's anything else. I don't think so. OK, so that's ReSharper. Um, of course, it provides very nice quick fixes, kind of background compilation stuff. You can see when code is. This is great for new programmers as well when you, they start teaching. So I use it in my classes. I make people install it as trial version because it saves me the time of having people fight with the language and instead learn TDD. So ReSharper just helps with that, helps you focus. And testdriven.net, who's using that? OK, if you don't know testdriven.net, there is a personal version. I highly recommend it. What uh, TD.net does, uh, it's kind of, it, it's basically a test runner that runs inside Visual Studio so that you don't have to uh, uh, use an external tool like NUnit. If you have ReSharper, it also has a test runner. Also, CodeRush has a test runner. But there's something special about this specific one. First of all, it's really fast. Second of all, Jamie, the guy who wrote it, uh, is, uh, has been doing this for several years now. And this is a very mature product. It works in all versions of Visual Studio. At some point, he even had a version that ran on Visual Studio Express, if you remember which created kind of legal problems, and it's not allowed to have add-ins in Visual Studio Express. You basically don't have APIs to load them, and he found a way to load his add-in into uh, Visual Studio Express. So after Microsoft removed his MVP status, he decided he will stop doing that, and that version doesn't exist anymore. But now you can do a lot of other things. For example, you can test the same test with Silverlight or in process by debugging and coverage, and actually see coverage with end cover and, and or the coverage of Visual Studio. The most intriguing aspect about this is that you can you test with debugger and debug into your tests. What's interesting is that it doesn't have to be a test to start using this feature. You can basically go to any piece of code and say, um, I'm going to put a breakpoint here, right click, um, test with debugger. Now, if the function takes arguments, uh, it's going to uh, send them as null. If it doesn't take any arguments, then no problem. So right now, I am in debug mode. Of course, item content is null and so on. What's nice is that you don't have to create a console application to start debugging your code. It's pretty cool to just create your own little method that calls this method with the right parameters and then start debugging directly from the class that you're trying to solve. So that's a very useful thing. Works again in all versions of Visual Studio. So that's my personal dev machine. Now I want to talk about uh, uh, how we use the Amazon EC2 cloud. Has anyone here used or tried to use Amazon EC2? OK. Who likes it? OK. Has anyone here tried to use Azure, by the way? OK. Who likes it? OK, two out of three, that's pretty good. I, I haven't tried Azure yet, but uh, uh, as far as I understand right now, the Amazon EC2 stuff is much more mature because it has existed for longer. Um, it, it's also just a little bit different from what Azure tries to uh, provide. But first of all, I want to explain why we're using it. So the way we're using Amazon EC2, EC2 is a, a, a way to host machines on the Amazon servers. You can create multiple machines on it. You can uh, uh, duplicate them. Think of it like a big virtual machine host that you can decide on which center it, it, uh, it, is, it runs. There are five or six centers around the world. We use it to uh, take away all the build stuff, automated builds, including document server and build agents. And they all run on Amazon EC2. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Let's see. Um, this is 
what the Amazon EC2 console looks like for TypeMock. Uh, what you can see in the green is these are instances of computers that are actually running. If I click on one of them, I can see their uh, public DNS. I can connect to it via uh, a, a remote desktop. Uh, I can create a new machine with uh, Windows base, uh, that's either Windows or Linux based. And then I can remote to it with an administrator password that's generated especially for me. All machines are dedicated. They are not shared. You pay for uh, per hour of a machine. All machines are of specific size. For example, micro, small, medium. And there are large, extra large, and so on. For example, we have uh, a CRM test machine that is large right here. And it's stopped right now because you can start and stop it whenever you want to do some testing on it because we're trying to move to CRM 5. CR CRM 4 was just so amazing. Now, uh, uh, for each machine, I can see the health for an instance. Uh, for example, I can see the uh, monitoring for the document server. If I'm still logged in, I might need to log in again. Yes, I am need, needing to log in. Don't, don't uh, remember this, please. Now, after I log in, I can see the actual uh, connection and monitoring, for example, network throughput, disk, I.O., and so on. These are the instances and so on. And let's see. This is the monitoring stuff. This is important if you have a server that's required to have a specific output. Now, you can create also your own clusters and uh, balancers that run in the cloud. And the coolest thing is that you can create machines that are part of your, your network. They're actually like a VPN. You, they're, you can access them as if they're local. So all these things are possible. And what's cool about it, if you're doing like a lean startups uh, kind of thing, you don't need to buy any hardware. You can raise up a bunch of machines. And tomorrow the startup closes, you just stop a bunch of machines, and you don't have any hardware to deal with. That's pretty cool. Of course, I can create a snapshot of each one of those machines and then load 50 of them at the same time if I really wanted to. For example, I have one x86 agent and one 64-bit agent. And I can load five of them right now if I really wanted to. It would take about 15 minutes. And then I would have a bunch of agents. Uh, what are these agents? They're running in uh, they're agents that are used for automated builds, which we will look at shortly. So that's. Uh, that's where we get into the build server. So one of the machines that we use inside the Amazon EC2 cloud is the build server. And the build server itself has several things that are running. For example, uh, we, uh, we have JetBrains TeamCity running on it. This is the actual TeamCity, what TeamCity might look like. I can connect to it uh, directly from my own machine. Um, let's see. I should have it here. There it is. So this is the actual uh, uh, project for TestLint, which is a free product which looks at uh, unit tests and finds common problems. And I can look at the tests that were run. I can look at the uh, build log. And what uh, TeamCT basically does, it's a continuous integration server. It will trigger builds based on various parameters. It will. Uh, uh, it, w it can run its own kind of build, uh, build scripts based on Ant, MS Build, whatever you want. But we don't use the built-in uh, scripting tools. What we use is Final Builder, which you will see in a second. So these are examples of some of the tests that are running inside uh, TestLint. And what's cool is that, of course, you can manage the agents from here. These are the agents running. You can see that they're running on EC2 based on the names. Uh, another thing that I like about TeamCity is that it can connect to the cloud and create instances of agents if they're missing. It has an EC2 capacity uh, enabler. So I can actually click the Cloud tab and configure instances of machines and say, look, if there is a new build that needs to be run, but you don't have any instance available that can run it, or there is no uh, correct instance, like with the correct requirements, like the environment variables are correct and so on, I wanted to create a new instance in Amazon EC2 
wait for it to load, and run the build on that agent. And this happens automatically. And I can also tell it to shut down that agent after a specific amount of time. These are the current two agent machines. We, I specifically disabled them, but uh, these are old machines that we used to. We don't need that currently. We don't have any high loads, and we just recreated the instances of the machines. So we have agents with VS2010, we have agents with VS2008, and so on, uh, based on the needs, on what we're testing. Um, so it's a very nice way to manage things, no XML required. If there's one thing that I, uh, that I uh, need to know about something is that I don't need to work on any type of XML. How, how much more time do I have, by the way? Great answer, thank you. If anyone knows, let me know. Uh, when did we start? Just need to uh, like maximize the amount of time. Okay, so that's Team City, and the second thing that we have is the Final Builder that runs from it. So Final Builder is a you could call it a visual script tool. Um, it's kind of like what MS Build should have been in the first place. Uh, it's very visual. It's very hierarchical kind of like XML, but it's not XML. All you edit is only this uh, uh, UI. Um, let's see, I have an example of the scripts for, I think this is testnet, by the way, and how they might look. So this is, for example, a script that will execute on a build agent. For example, uninstall stuff from the GAC if we have any type mock dependencies just in case. Uh, try variables, run the build, run the tests. And each one of these are at the bottom are actually tabs that you can see. So they're kind of like procedures that you can run. So this is how I might run the tests. I might change some text files as well. And all these things are tasks that appear on the left side. There are basically tasks for anything you can think of. This is a very, very mature tool. If you're thinking about loading stuff from the GAC, of course, that's possible. Resetting IIS, sure. Uh, replacing stuff in XML files, no problem. Registering DLLs, whatever. Uh, even you know, like burning DVDs, uh, commit to source control using COM plus, compile using a bunch of compilers, database related tasks, disk management, blah, 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 blah. So it's a very powerful thing. And the, the big thing about it, what makes it better, is that if we bring a new developer into our team, we can teach them how the build works in about five minutes. They can start changing the build in about 10 minutes. Because the first five, they're like, I'm oh, sure, maybe I can do this, maybe I can do that. What happens if I, if I double click on this? I get this nice little dialogue. And of course, there are a bunch of uh, variables that are built in. So it's not all hard coded, it's all relative. So this will work on any machine. You can use variables, you can use a lot of stuff and reuse the same actions. You can also create your own actions with, with UI in .NET, in C Sharp or VB. And they're all extendable, so you, Final Builder will recognize if you have custom actions specifically for your product, you can create those in about 15 minutes. It's very, very simple and easy. Um, uh, another uh, cool thing is that you can debug the builds. You can actually put breakpoints and run the build and check at every point if the build is really complex, what are, what's going on? Or do I have any watches here below that I can take a look at? What is the current file name that I'm trying to run the tests on? If I want to just loop on stuff, I can, can have control, uh, uh, flow control that I can uh, work with. Um, so there are a lot of tasks. Definitely a lot of tasks. What source control do we use? We switched, uh, we used to use uh, source safe. Then we switched to subversion. And these days we work partially with subversion and partially with Merc. I'm not gonna say Mercurial because it breaks my teeth. I'm just gonna call it HG, how's that? Uh, we considered working with Git, but uh, Git on Windows is still not as easy as it should be. Uh, HG is much simpler. It has better tooling. 
and it's actually been around longer, so I, I consider it a bit more mature. The, the, both of these source control systems have kind of the same abilities, um, but Git uh, and GitHub especially is better if you're doing s open source software. If you're doing commercial software, it doesn't really matter. But for open source, GitHub allows you to see all the merges and how people could push stuff up to your repository and so on. If you've never heard the phrase, people pushing stuff up to your repository, that might sound a bit dirty, but it's actually a pretty good thing. Um, uh, what is the difference between that and SVN, or that and SourceSafe? There is one major difference between that plus Git and any other distributed source control uh, and uh, older tools like SourceSafe is that this actually can allow you to commit locally to your local machine. So you can actually say, kind of think of it like that there's a program where people have to answer questions, but if they're afraid they're going to lose all the money they stacked up, they say bank. And all the money saves up, and then they start again with fresh new uh, answers, but less money. But all the money they already saved is in the bank. So it's kind of like this. It allows you to bank the source code you've already written locally and basically check it in. It's a source control. The whole database of source lies on your local machine and on the server and everyone else's machine. And then when you commit the whole thing to the server, it already has all your older commits. But the cool thing is that you can roll back locally as well. So you don't have to worry about not checking in source code for three days. You can actually uh, do very complex stuff locally if you're, for example, on a train for three days and still not have to worry about like copying the whole source directory just so you don't lose what's actually working right now. So that's one of the powerful things. It also allows better and faster merges. This and Git, very powerful tools. But again, we use the tooling for this. So Visual HG in uh, Visual Studio and Tortoise as, as a HG in Windows. So that's the build server. On the build agent, what happens is that the build server, the TeamCD stuff, uh, it copies all the, uh, get it gets the latest uh, versions from source control. We use a hosted source control. And it copies it to a build agent, and then it invokes an action. In this case, the action is a command line, which I tell it to, to run. The command line will run a final builder script. That script will internally at least do several things. It will compile the code. When we compile the code, some of our tools use PostSharp. Anyone here know what PostSharp is? Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's a very powerful way to inject AOP-like behavior into your code. You put special attributes where you want them. For example, logging. And by default, you get automatic logging to whatever framework that you're interested in. You can create your own attributes, of course. It interjects at compile time. So after a code gets compiled, it gets, uh, it gets changed and compiled with the PostSharp uh, implementation as well. So it's a compile time AOP framework. It will not work on existing third parties. You have to have access to the source code to get this benefit. We use it uh, to put just one uh, attribute at the assembly uh, level that logs everything. So we basically use it for two lines of code. That's all we do. And so we don't have to do logging. And then we have another attribute for exception management globally. So we don't have to do exception management uh, unless we really want to and we want to, to have some kind of flow. Um, then we obfuscate. Uh, if you're doing commercial product, obfuscation sometimes is a must. You never know when a, a company that does a product that looks exactly like pr your product uh, but uh, uh, but has basically copied all of all of that you've done will come up. You never know if that's going to happen. So obfuscation is really important. Uh, one tool that I found is the uh, crypto obfuscator, which actually works. I've tried at least five or six of these, and this one actually works. It's n it's pretty simple. It's not as usable as it could be, but it works pretty quickly, and it it doesn't have as much bugs as the others. Well, NUnit, I think most people here use either NUnit or MS Test, so I'm just going to say this very quickly. We use NUnit. We don't use MBUnit, CSUnit, uh, whatever unit. We use NUnit because it's very simple. It has grown up to have most of the features we already need anyway. 
and uh, it, it's just uh, it's actually just not really a big deal right if we ever wanted to we could always switch we also use a mix of MS test because our customers use MS test so we want to make sure it's kind of like an integration test for us that we can work with MS test our framework so that's the build agent now then we have on Amazon EC2 we have the documents the docs so we, we use a help, uh, help and manual to write the documentation. Um, again, I've looked at multiple tools to write documentation, inclu doing, including Document X from Innovasys and so on. This is just a very usable tool. It's just, there are some things that we just uh, seem to, uh, they've thought about it already. For example, uh, using macros inside the, inside the HTML so you don't have to go find and replace stuff. Um, to create these kind of things is actually pretty easy. And it outputs to basically any output you, you, you're interested in. So it's a very powerful and simple tool to use. Uh, to show the documentation, we use Help Server. Help Server is an ASP.NET application which you put on your server. And then you take the compiled CHM file and you just put it on the server in a special directory. And then it creates this website for you. So if I, if I'll show you this live. Um, so this is actually dynamically generated and then cached. Of course, is there no internet connection here? Of course, very slow probably. This is dynamically generated and cached from CHM files. And then it's of course, Google will find it. It's not really a problem for Google to find these kind of things. And I like the way it's presented. It also has built-in search and indexes. So it's actually a very powerful thing. Uh, all you need is the, ex the already existing CHM file deployed to an FTP as part of your build and you're done. It's a very powerful thing and very simple. And it's configurable. You can put analytics on it as well. So that's what we use the Amazon EC2 Cloud for. There's one more thing, but that's where we get the deployment insight, where we use Amazon as well. How much more time left? You can just say it. It will take less time. Sorry? 10 minutes. Okay. So fog bugs. Who here uses fog bugs? Okay. Not a lot of people. We find that it works. What we like about it is that for bug management, it, it works with the email system. So someone sends an email, we get, it creates a bug in the, in the system, and then we can answer from the uh, bug system itself. I'm, fortunately, I cannot show you actual bugs from customers. Uh, because we cannot share customer data. Um, for logging, we use Gibraltar. Gibraltar is actually a, a very nice commercial tool. And what they have is integration with PostShop, for example, that will add very powerful logging as part of your application. What's powerful? Let's see, I think I have it here installed. Um, Gibraltar, yeah. So Gibraltar Analyst is the tool that you might use to uh, start working with and see the applications. Where are you? There it is. So this is an example of what logs that you get from remote clients, assuming that they, they, they said that it's OK to send it, might look like. You can see all the sessions and all the latest sessions with errors. For example, this is an error for we specially generated for the demos. This is what an error might look like. You can see the time uh, over time, the CPU and memory usage at the customer site. Um, let's try and look, search for one that actually has uh, a problem. Okay, this one has a problem. We don't take any kind of. We can decide if it's anonymous or not. Of course, everything is anonymous by default. I can just find the exception. For example, here the add-in got an exception, so we can see the exception itself. If there was a PDB attached, we would a we would be able to see the exact uh, 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 details of the source code. And here are the session details of the actual computer. I can see what threads were running, what assemblies. This is all happening automatically. So it's a great way to find bugs on remote customers' machines. Uh, and not requesting all the data manually. And again, this is all done with about two lines of, uh, of attribute code. Um, so that's, uh, 
that's the Gibraltar stuff. And then we have one more thing that I use. This is more of a product management kind of thing, but it does make me a better developer because as a developer, I need to think about how people actually use the product. So usage statistics is, I think, something that we most developers have not really thought about. We use something called Equitech to basically transmit, assuming that uh, based on user, uh, uh, based on the fact that the user said that it's okay, to submit how users are, are using the application. Which button did they click? Which link did they use? And so on. Um, here's what it might look like. Since it's all anonymous, I don't have a problem showing you some of this stuff. This is an example of how people are using the feedback form on Isolator++, which is installed in their system. They can see over time which how it was started, which features are used, how many installs I have. I can see over time, I can see if there is uh, up or down, how, if there's like a spike, or if no one clicks one of the buttons on my application, I know that maybe I, can, I need to move it, or it's not visible enough. This is really important stuff because we, uh, we, we imagine stuff about our users, but we never really know. So usage statistics is an important topic that I think uh, we should start getting into. For licensing, we use crypto licensing, another tool that just works. It's very simple to use, and I haven't found a lot of good licensing tools that are not crappy, seriously. This one is simple and just works, including creating automatic uh, texts for, that you can send to a customer and so on, and it's fully customizable and automatable. Um, the last but not least, we use simple notification service from Amazon so that our users can communicate with us. So this allows us allows the user to communicate to communicate with us uh, even from within Visual Studio. In this case, I don't have the demo here. But for example, uh, they can have a feedback form that they can send a message. And from the application, we will send a notification to Amazon. Notification is something you have multiple subscribers. It can be uh, sent as an email. It can be sent as a JSON message, and so on. So it's a very powerful distributed system for getting information in an event-driven manner. So every time a customer wants to contact us through an application, we get uh, both email notifications and a fog bugs notification as well. So that's the deployment insight. Those are practically most of the tools that I, uh, I have here. I have a couple of more. If I had more time, I would do it. Uh, for example, I would t tell you that I use Notepad2, uh, which is a very powerful editor on Windows. Very simple, actually and I use it in conjunction with Total Commander. But now it's time for something a little bit more special. This is something I like to finish my talks with, a little song about, uh, well, some t this time it's gonna be a special song. But for that, I would need a volunteer. That volunteer will get a, no, yeah, sir, you, come over. What's your name? No, you cannot volunteer twice. Sorry, yeah, what's your name? Danielle, can you please give your hands for Danielle? Thank you. Do you know what to do? Do you know what to do? Press the space bar. Yeah, press the space bar. Not yet, though. Um, let's see. It's over here. Um, it's a song about time. And this song is based on a true story, of course. All my songs are based on pain, really. Um, so first I want to explain what this song is about. Um, this song is dedicated to people who worked with relational databases. <laughs> and uh, it's something that I've experienced plenty of times myself. Hello DB, my old friend. I need to work with you again. That stored procedure ain't working well Who wrote that trigger should go to jail And that index, it is slower than a snail What the hell? I guess it's time for violence Man, whoever wrote, go Man, whoever wrote this code that bastard's gonna hit the road Now the customer is gonna sue Instead of wet my face 
face is turning blue And it seems like there is no way out of this There's just a hiss I guess it's time for violence I'm angry and I want to name That the play should be a shame What's that you're saying? It's me to play That Database was my own sick game. Oh, that's right. It was me who did the design. It was mine. I guess it's time for silence. Thank you very much. Thank you.